what's good my guys i'm back with another reaction video and today we're going to be watching five mysterious unsolved cases number eight all right um i don't know what to expect in this honestly um, but let's get right into it it's a 27 minute long video but we're gonna watch it all let's get right into it Five Mysterious Unsolved Cases, Number Eight. Rella Sherrod was just eight years old when she was last seen in March 2014. For more than a year before her disappearance, Relisha, her mother, and her three younger brothers had been living in a homeless shelter in Washington, D.C., alongside hundreds of other families. 51-year-old Khalil Tatum worked at the shelter as a janitor. He had former felony convictions for breaking and entering, burglary, and larceny. Tatum had grown close to Relisha and her family over the course of their stay. Despite a policy that prohibited fraternization between the shelter staff and its residents, Relisha and Tatum spent time alone together, and Tatum gave her gifts, including a tablet. He did something to that girl. Relisha even referred to him as her god daddy. Tatum spent time with other young girls staying at the shelter as well, but was never disciplined for this behavior. Toward the end of February 2014, Relisha's mother, Shamika Young, placed her into Tatum's care, allowing her daughter to leave the shelter and stay with him. Young was reportedly unhappy with the conditions at the shelter and may have been trying to give Relisha a better life. But once Tatum took over caring for the eight-year-old, she began to miss school at an alarming rate. When school officials spoke to Young about the absences, she told them Relisha was being cared for by the man she called Dr. Tatum. When they called Tatum, he said he was treating Relisha for neurological issues. By March 19th, Relisha had been absent from school over 30 times. When child services arranged to meet with Tatum, he never showed. It was at this time social workers learned that Tatum wasn't a doctor at all and contacted the police. Young told investigators that Tatum and her daughter were attending a medical conference in Atlanta and that she'd spoken to Relisha on the phone on March 17th. Young was convinced her daughter was safe and declined to file a police report, even though Tatum could not be reached on his cell phone and the DC apartment he had shared with his wife was empty. A missing persons investigation was launched. Security footage of Tatum and Relisha was discovered at the Holiday Inn Express in Northeast DC. The two could be seen walking down a hallway at the hotel on February 26th. Both Tatum and Relisha look at ease in this footage. They're each carrying a shopping bag and walking at a leisurely pace, and nothing seems out of the ordinary. A passerby would likely assume they were father and daughter. Footage from March 1st showed the pair in a similar situation walking to a hotel room at the Days Inn. This video is the last confirmed sighting of Relisha. When Tatum's wife, Andrea, was found shot to death in a Maryland hotel room, investigators ramped up their search for both he and Relisha. They learned that at the beginning of March, he had purchased large trash bags, a shovel, and quicklime. On March 31st, Tatum's body was discovered at Kenilworth Park and Aquatic Gardens. He had shot himself with the same gun that killed Andrea. There was no trace of Relisha. Child Services was criticized for waiting so long to take action regarding Relisha's absences from school. The agency had been involved with her family before, finding that the home environment Young created was unsafe and that she had medically neglected at least one of her children. But it wasn't until Relisha vanished that Young lost custody of her kids. She was also investigated for obstruction of justice due to the statements she had made about where Relisha was, but was never charged. She rarely speaks to the media about Relisha's disappearance. 
In a statement to the Washington Post in 2014, Young said, It's not my fault. I'm tired of laying my head down to get some rest, and I can't even reach out and grab my daughter. Relisha has never been seen or heard from again. Authorities believe she was likely killed by Tatum. His purchases in early March indicate he may have planned to get rid of human remains. In 2020, police searched a series of tunnels underneath the shelter, which Tatum would have had knowledge of as the janitor there. Nothing was found, and the young girl's fate is still unknown. Rella Sherrod would now be 15 years old. Belgian backpacker Theo Ayes began his solo travels in Australia in late 2018. Nearly a year later, he disappeared a week before his flight back to Belgium. 18-year-old Theo arrived in Byron Bay, a popular tourist destination, on May 29, 2019. He checked into a single room at the Wake Up Hostel in Belongil. It was the final leg of his trip. He planned to spend a few days in Byron Bay before taking a bus to Sydney and flying home. On the evening of May 31, 2019, CCTV captured Theo and a new friend he'd met at the hostel buying some alcohol at a local liquor store. The footage indicates nothing out of the ordinary in Theo's behavior. The pair went back to the hostel, and later in the evening, Theo visited a bar called Cheeky Monkeys, located about a 20-minute walk from the hostel. Around 11 p.m., he left. It's unclear whether he was overly intoxicated, but witnesses have stated he was not drunk that night. CCTV footage of Theo leaving the bar provides the last known images of him before his disappearance. As he walked away from the bar, Theo used his phone to send several messages to friends, watch a YouTube video, and use Google Maps, presumably to navigate his way back to the hostel, but he never made it there. Cell phone records indicate that Theo actually walked in the opposite direction. He kept up a quick pace, following an unusual route down dark streets and through bushland to Tallow Beach. Throughout the journey, Theo was sending and receiving messages. After sending a WhatsApp message to his stepsister shortly before 1 a.m., his phone stopped emitting a signal. Theo's family called New South Wales police, reporting they hadn't heard from him. The same day, the hostel where Theo was staying contacted the police as well. His checkout date had been three days earlier, but he was nowhere to be found, and his belongings were still in his room. Theo's parents, Laurent Tellez and Vinciane Delforge, flew to Australia to search for their missing son. Helicopters, divers, rock climbers, dogs, and drones were all used in the extensive hunt for Theo, but to no avail. A month later, a baseball cap was found by searchers at Tallow Beach. It resembled the one Theo was wearing when he was last seen, and his family believe it's his. The official search was called off shortly after this discovery. The final signal that could be traced from his cell phone placed Theo in the area of Cape Byron on June 1st. Authorities theorize that he may have fallen from the cliffs near the lighthouse on Byron Bay, but there's no explanation as to why he traveled away from his hostel to this remote area in the middle of the night. In 2019, the backpacker Theo was seen buying alcohol with Antoine von Latem told the Daily Telegraph about the night Theo disappeared. He described their trip to the bar. We went out together after leaving the hostel, and we arrived with some other people from the hostel, and then everyone talked with other people. An hour later, he was kicked out of Cheeky Monkeys. It's not clear why Theo was asked to leave the bar. Some theories suggest he was overly intoxicated, perhaps as the result of a spiked drink, and simply got lost that night. Others wonder if he had an altercation of some kind inside Cheeky Monkeys, which did have a bit of a rough reputation. 
Theo's whereabouts remain completely unknown, but his family maintains hope that he is alive. They even wonder if he could be being held against his will. His father, Laurent, told media outlets, as long as we have not found his body, we keep hope. Emporia State University has 200 academic programs, from accounting to zoology. With all the experiences of a larger school and the benefits of small school attention, you'll get the classes and hands-on experiences that will take you further. Learn more at emporia.edu. Legs. Just walked and then accidentally fell. I don't know. Can Americans with no degree really get $6,495 from this education program? The answer is yes. So this controversial... On the evening of November 3rd, 2018, 40-year-old mother of five, Tamla Horsford, attended an adult slumber party with other local mothers in Cumming, Georgia. By the following morning, Tamla would be dead and nobody would be able to explain why. On the morning of November 4th, Tamla's body was discovered in the backyard of Jeannie Myers' home. Myers had invited a group of mothers who met through the Youth Football League over to celebrate her birthday, offering to let them spend the night to avoid drinking and driving. Though the party was planned for a group of nine women, two men also stayed at the house that night. Myers' boyfriend, Jose Barrera, and Tom Smith, the husband of another attendee. Barrera and Smith hung out in the finished basement while the women socialized upstairs. Tamla drank tequila and went out to the back porch balcony to smoke throughout the night, mostly cigarettes, but also marijuana until Myers asked her to stop. At some point, the men came back upstairs and the group played Cards Against Humanity. Around 11.30 p.m., some guests began to head home, while those who planned to stay the night got ready for bed. The last person to see Tamla alive was Bridget Fuller, who left the house at 1.47 a.m. when her husband picked her up. She told police that she and Tamla were the only two people left downstairs, and that Tamla was eating gumbo soup and planned to smoke another cigarette before going to bed. The home's security system registered the back door opening, closing, and opening for a final time at 1.57 a.m. At 8.45 a.m., Tamla was seen on the lawn 14 feet below the porch, face down and unresponsive by Myers' aunt, who lived at the house. Jeannie Myers and Jose Barrera called 911 at 8.59 a.m. The homeowner, Myers, could be heard guessing that Tamla fell off the balcony, which had a nearly four-foot-tall railing. Barrera told the 911 operator that Tamla wasn't breathing and described a small cut on her wrist, suggesting she may have tried to hurt herself. Okay, what's going on? Um... We had people over last night, we were drinking. Most of us went to bed. One of them stayed on the balcony. She was drinking, and we just went out, sit outside, and she's laying face down in the backyard. It looks like, may, I'm guessing, maybe she fell off the balcony, but she's stiff. Okay, is she breathing? I, I, don't, I don't know if she's face down. Okay, how, how old is she? At 41. Here, hold on. Hey, this is Jose Barrera. Hey, have y'all checked to see if she's breathing? She's not moving one bit. She's not breathing. Um, okay. I just tried to assess her Tesla. She's completely face down in the yard. Um, she is stiff. Okay. Do you see any blood or anything to where that, from where she fell? Um, I. I I don't know if I should move her over. I mean, she's completely face down. Okay. I mean, can you just check and see if she's breathing? If, if she's not breathing and you and you know she's gone, then just leave her where she's at. If she... Okay. One minute. You know, like my girlfriend said, people were over last night. <clears throat> um, 
just we were at she was her birthday party. We we're not the woman that we believe to be deceased, but my girlfriend's birthday party. Instead of having everybody go out, she had everyone stay in, and she was the last one I saw before everybody. I mean, everybody was typically put off to bed. She was the last one in the kitchen. She was just either waiting around for a ride or waiting until the morning. Okay. Was she there with anyone else? Um, I don't believe anybody was. Uh, my girlfriend has cameras here on the back deck that we can check. Okay. That I think would have caught the incident if she fell from here. Again, I, I, true, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say if she fell from from the deck or if she was already downstairs. She was the only on smoker second. here. And I'm sorry. Thank you. That's awesome. Barrera mentioned on the call that the house had security cameras and were pointed at the backyard, but they were later found to have dead batteries. The Forsyth County Sheriff's Office reported multiple blunt force injuries in Tamla's autopsy. Noting a high blood alcohol level in her system, investigators agreed she had probably accidentally fallen off the balcony to her death. The other partygoers reported going to bed before Tamla. Tamla's friends and family were suspicious of the story. Whatever had happened to her, it seemed she had been alone. The family asked for an independent autopsy from the Georgia Bureau of Investigations. This autopsy found that Tamla had suffered more severe injuries than might be expected from an accidental fall. In addition to blunt force trauma to her head, neck, and torso, she also had cuts on her face hand and legs, and a laceration to her heart's right ventricle. Her right wrist was dislocated, her neck was broken, and there were four types of hemorrhages in her skull and brain. A blood alcohol level of 0.238 was found in the GBI's toxicology report, in addition to traces of an anxiety drug and THC. Two months after Tamla's death, Barrera, the man who reported it to 911, was fired from his job as a Forsyth County court officer. For unknown reasons, he had tried multiple times to illegally access the official incident report. Despite the unusual circumstances, Tamla's death was ruled an accident and the case was closed on February 20, 2019. The Horsford family hired attorney Ralph Fernandez to continue looking into Tamla's death. On June 5, 2020, Fernandez informed Tamla's husband, Leander, that his team's findings suggested the incident had not been an accident, but a homicide. Tamla's injuries indicated she could have been involved in a struggle, and the investigation had left much to be desired. The scene had been poorly preserved. Autopsy photos were never released to Fernandez and were possibly not taken at all and witness statements that conflicted with one another had not been followed up on. A week later, Forsyth County Sheriff Ron Freeman asked the GBI to reopen the case. The agency agreed but did not provide a timeline for their investigation. Over two years later, it is still unclear whether Tamla Horsford died as a result of a terrible accident or something more sinister. On Thursday, December 7, 2000, 22-year-old Trevor Dealey vanished after attending his office Christmas party in Dublin, Ireland. Trevor had worked for Bank of Ireland Asset Management for about a year and had recently returned from a vacation in Alaska at the time of his disappearance. The party took place at various locations throughout the night, beginning at a bar called Copperface Jack's, moving to the Hilton Hotel and landing at nightclub Buck Whaley's. Trevor walked out of Buck Whaley's alone at around 3.25 in the morning, but instead of returning to his apartment, he went to his office where security let him in. CCTV video from the building that night shows a man dressed in black waiting outside before Trevor arrived. As Trevor approaches the gate, the two briefly speak.
While inside the office, Trevor checked his email, gathered some things he needed for the next day's shift, and spoke to Carl Pender, a colleague who was working the night shift. Trevor left the building at 4.03 carrying an umbrella. The man in black was no longer outside. Trevor called a friend as he walked toward his home and left a voicemail the friend described as normal. This was the last time anyone heard from him. Trevor was not reported missing until the following Monday. His absence at work was written off because of the party the night before, and his roommates were out of town over the weekend. Once it was clear Trevor was unaccounted for, his family and friends circulated thousands of leaflets, hung posters throughout Dublin, and went door to door asking for information. Investigators discovered that at 4.14 on the morning he went missing, Trevor appeared on CCTV on the corner of Bagot Street Bridge and Haddington Road, still walking in the direction of his apartment. This is the last known footage of Trevor Dealey. The footage also shows a man in black passing through the area only 30 seconds behind him. Investigators believe this is the same man who spoke to him outside of the bank. This individual has never come forward, and Trevor has never been seen again. Was the man in black a stranger? Was he waiting outside the bank for Trevor specifically? Was he the same person seen following behind in the final footage? Or could Trevor have simply fallen into the Grand Canal or the River Daughter as he made his way home through the rain and wind? A new investigation into Trevor's disappearance was launched in December 2016 with a 100,000 euro reward offered for information. In August 2017, a police informant told investigators Trevor had been murdered by a known criminal involved in drugs and prostitution in the area. That theory, however, has never been proven and no arrests have ever been made. On September 22, 2019, the naked body of 15-year-old Chan Yin Lam was found floating in the sea off Yao Tong, Hong Kong. A preliminary autopsy found no lacerations, contusions, or sign of any other assault. Investigators suspected Chan's death was a suicide, and her body was quickly cremated. But the incident would soon become the center of a conspiracy theory-fueled mystery. On the afternoon of September 19th, Chan separated from a group of friends at Meifu Station in the Lai Chi Kok area of Hong Kong. She sent a final message on her phone telling some friends she intended to return home, then seemed to vanish into thin air. Chan's family reported her disappearance to police two days later. Her phone and some stationery were found on the ground in Tiu Keng Leng Railway Station. Surveillance footage was soon located that had captured her movements. Chan had left the campus of the Youth College at the vocational training school where she was taking classes and walked barefoot in the direction of the nearby waterfront. After Chan's body was recovered, social media theories emerged alleging that she had been murdered by government officials for supporting and participating in the 2019 Hong Kong protests. The protests were demonstrations against a bill that would have allowed extradition of Hong Kong residents to face the legal systems of mainland China and other jurisdictions. Chan had reportedly handed out protest leaflets on one occasion, and friends of hers confirmed that she had attended demonstrations. Internet sleuths began theorizing that police officers had assaulted Chan and thrown her body into the sea. Chan's mother stated she believed her daughter committed suicide and may have even been suffering from psychosis. Chan had reportedly told her mother that she heard voices. She had also been struggling in her relationship with her boyfriend who was in jail. In early August, Chan was captured on video in a train station, appearing extremely distraught, allegedly because of an issue relating to her boyfriend. Surrounded by concerned strangers and eventually police officers, she's crying and yelling as she sits on the floor of the station. 
遮面，佢隨時可以拉我藏有非法武器喺度。你而家手機都可以話有攻擊性。Reportedly, as a result of her protest participation, Chan had been sent to a juvenile detention center on August 12, 2019, and had stayed there until September 11. While there, she was charged with property damage after tearing apart some papers. She was due to appear in court for the charge on September 20 and was expected to face a separate charge of assaulting a police officer on September 26. She had allegedly kicked an officer at Tong Fook Correctional Institution, where her boyfriend was imprisoned. Despite these details of Chan's struggles in the weeks leading up to her death, doubters were very vocal on social media. Students at Chan's school demanded the release of CCTV footage from the day she was last seen alive. The school eventually made public 16 video clips that show Chan moving around the campus for over an hour on September 19th. In the first few clips, Chan is still wearing her shoes. She appears to remove them after climbing a stairwell and coming back down the stairs barefoot. She's also seen reading from some papers inside an elevator. Chan appears distracted and possibly distraught, and she moves around the school without a clear destination. The teenager fidgets and walks aimlessly. On three separate occasions, she pushes the call button for an elevator and wanders off before it arrives. In the final clip, Chan is seen walking outside on the street, presumably to the seaside. Some have suggested that the girl in the CCTV footage is not Chan, but an imposter or actress participating in a cover-up of her murder. Armchair detectives have noticed a difference in appearance between the young woman in the videos and photos of Chan seen on her social media accounts and missing poster. Many point out a difference in her eyebrows specifically. They also find it suspicious that Chan's clothes managed to go missing between the time she was last seen and when her body was found in the sea. Interestingly, Chan was an accomplished swimmer. She'd even won swimming awards in the past, which cast doubt on the likelihood that she would choose to die by drowning. Despite the suspicion that surrounds Chan's death, her family and friends have positively identified her in the released clips, and those closest to her seem to accept that she simply took her own life. Sadly, it looks like we will never know for sure what really happened to Chan Yin Lam. Which of these unsolved cases did you find the most mysterious? Do you have theories of your own about what really happened to any of these people? y'all think down below y'all i don't know what do y'all think happened to each of these people but uh make sure y'all stay safe out there bro uh hit the like button subscribe join the game y'all let's get to a thousand subscribers uh my birthday coming up y'all april 1st well first my brother coming my brother birthday coming up his is march 28th my little brother and then mine is april 1st then the, my older brother is april 11th and then we're all aries except for my sister she's a libra her birthday in october 7th um most of my family are fire signs i don't even know why why i just changed the topic like that uh hit the subscribe you all Hit the subscribe button like the video if y'all liked it hopefully y'all watched the whole thing let's get these watch time hours up all right without further ado i'm gonna get up out of here and i'll catch y'all next video peace